I am noticing a significant shift in public sentiment towards climate change. Now, what used to be strictly a partisan issue is now being talked about on every side of the political spectrum. Now, I'm no scientist, I'm no weather expert, I'm an investor, my name is Jay Martin and I'm the host of The Jay Martin Show. But as an investor, I watch public sentiment super, super closely and this change is very real. People's attention and more importantly, their wallets, their money are starting to migrate towards solutions that clean up the earth. Now, I've spent a large percentage of my life in beautiful wilderness areas, very remote parts of the natural world where there's still super healthy wildlife populations and we can still drink from the rivers, all right? So I don't need to be a climate expert to know intimately what we stand to lose if we don't take care of this planet. But probably like you, I watch all the language and the narratives spun out of meetings like the Paris Agreement and write most of it off as political lip service because let's be honest, a goal like a carbon neutral planet by 2050, it sounds great, but setting a goal is really, really easy. Doing the work to accomplish our goals, that's the hard part. And I've yet to see any real concrete steps that convince me we're actually moving in that direction. But my guest today says that has changed. He believes we now have the right incentive of mechanisms in place for the world's heaviest carbon emitting industries to begin investing aggressively in the technologies and the activities that drive us towards a carbon neutral future. Now, can we become a carbon neutral planet? Sure, we could do anything. I will bet all day long on human ingenuity and innovation, but innovation takes money and money has been the missing piece of this conversation for most of my life. We are now seeing that change. We've already seen billions of dollars flood towards the carbon neutral agenda. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. As we're going to get into in this discussion, converting our planet to carbon neutrality is likely a $150 trillion problem. That's a lot of dough, all right? Now, my guest today is Justin Cochran. He's the CEO of a company called Carbon Streaming Corporation. They've only been around for two years. They've already deployed over $50 million into activities and projects that reduce carbon emissions worldwide. He has plenty more dry powder left to play with. So if you're at all interested in how we will mitigate the impacts of climate change, because this is going to happen no matter what side of the fence you land on. So you might want to pay attention. Then you'll probably enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Now, three things before we jump into this interview. Number one, all the advertising revenue generated from this YouTube channel is donated to an organization super close to my heart called Zero Ceiling. Zero Ceiling's mission is to end youth homelessness. The way they do this is by giving at-risk urban youth the opportunity to relocate to beautiful wilderness areas and then provide them with supportive housing, career training, and just generally positive influences on their life. Number two, I publish a weekly newsletter. It's the, my favorite thing that I do is authoring this letter where I talk about any current events that are front and center for me and share my perspective on them. You can subscribe by hitting the pinned comment right beneath this video. And number three, if you prefer to listen to this interview or any of my content, you can find me wherever you listen to your podcasts. Just search for The Jay Martin Show. All right, here's Justin Cochran. Enjoy. This is Jay Martin. All right, what's up, guys? Jay Martin here, investor and CEO of Cambridge House. And my guest today is Justin Cochran, the director and CEO of Carbon Streaming Corporation. Justin, I'm hoping that you're going to help me understand this new carbon market a little bit because I'm getting pitch deals left, right, and center and uh, don't have the tools in my tool belt to determine the good from the bad. I'm hoping you can help me with that today. Very happy to, Jay. And, and as always, thanks very much for having me on. I'm looking forward to chatting with you. Um, so so uh, I've got a handful of directions I want to go today. And why don't we start with you, though? So for anybody who's not familiar with yourself, uh, with Carbon Streaming, your business. Could we start with the highlight overview? Who are you and, and how do you spend your time, Justin? Yeah, so I've got a finance background myself. I've been in the royalty and streaming business for the last 15 years. Started out as an investment banker, uh, a real focus on the resource space for, for the last 15 years of my career, uh, but saw an opportunity about two years ago to say, take this same business model and apply it to the carbon credit world. 
but but me as a, as an investor, this is my fourth uh, royalty and streaming company that I've been a, a principal of, uh, raised and invested over two billion dollars uh, in this model, uh, and and you know love the carbon credit world for for applying the same very successful model out of out of the resource space to carbon credits, and we'll talk about why. Okay, yeah, and some companies that my audience is familiar with. We've had Sandstorm on the show. I know you're there for a while. Yeah. Um, so what, what is the carbon market? Give me the, the overview. What are we talking about? Yeah. So, so first off, uh, when you think about a carbon credit, uh, every carbon credit represents one metric ton of carbon dioxide. And that carbon credit then represents either a metric ton of carbon dioxide that's been removed from the atmosphere or a ton of CO2 that's been avoided from being emitted into the atmosphere. So it's a representation of something that's, of course, designed to help fight climate change and and lower greenhouse gas emissions. And these carbon credits themselves are generated from projects, different types of projects around the world. And once a carbon credit is created, it can be sold to uh, just about any international buyer around the world. So very international market uh, run mostly by nonprofits, conservation groups, environmentalists. Those are our partners. And, um, uh, and of course, the whole industry is designed. And the reason we started Carbon Streaming Corp was to invest in these climate change projects around the world and help accelerate the development of these projects. So you invest in climate change projects that therefore create new carbon credits that can then be bought and sold on the market. That's exactly right. Okay. Exactly right. Now, can you back up for a minute and explain to me why why we need carbon credits? So we need carbon credits because the world generates over 50 billion tons of, of carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide equivalents on an annual basis. Uh, and it's that carbon dioxide, of course, that's that's creating this global warming that we're seeing and climate change. So the goal and the Paris Agreement um, goal that was announced in the early 2000s is to is to take those carbon emissions down to zero in the next couple of decades. And the only re- way we're going to take emissions down to zero is if we give companies and governments and individuals incentives to to reduce their environmental footprint and their and their carbon footprint and so carbon credits have developed as a tool of of pricing carbon uh, and they're therefore encouraging companies to you know one invest in projects because there's economic value in creating these carbon credits um, but also as a as you know in, in many regulated uh, instances a penalty for not reducing emissions in so in, in in for example a cap and trade market where where emission caps are being lowered and companies that, that don't lower emissions are penalized okay now when you say uh, as per the Paris agreement to cut emissions carbon emissions to zero um, so we're talking about that being a carbon neutral world is that correct Correct. Exactly. Okay. Carbon neutral. And is the date that we want to accomplish this 2050? Do I have that right? That's exactly right. Yep. Okay. Yep. And, 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 and sorry, just, just the one thought is, is when we talk about carbon neutral, it, it means by 2050, we probably still have 10 billion tons of, of carbon emissions worldwide, but those are offset by 10 billion tons of carbon projects that are that are again either pulling co2 out of the atmosphere at the same time reforestation projects that are absorbing more carbon um uh, red projects we call them which are avoiding deforestation projects so so it's sort of a plus 10 and a minus 10 would offset to get to a neutral position that's the goal by 2050. right so we'll still be producing carbon emissions obviously but we'll have technologies or nature-based solutions in place that uh that absorb offset. those offset yeah. through absorption or well i got some more questions about like the avoidance but we'll get into that um <clears throat> okay and then the milestone uh near in our future is 2030 so 2050 the goal is carbon a carbon neutral planet right yep. Um, yep. We're, we're presently emitting you said 50 billion tons of carbon annually yep. so maybe we get to 10 billion by 2050 we offset with 10 billion in in carbon credits the earlier milestone in front of us is 2030, where we want to cut emissions by 50%. Do I understand that correct? Right. 
Yep, that, that's right. And, and to get us on that pathway towards being able to meet those, those 2050 goals. And, you know, we're, we're a long way off that pathway right now, but that's, that's absolutely the goal. Jay, is to start start those reductions today so that we're not falling. Every day, every day we wait, of course, we're falling further and further behind. Right. Now, what's your honest opinion, Justin? Is this a realistic, is this a realistic goal? Could the world be carbon neutral, the planet be carbon neutral by 2050? Could we cut our emissions, our global emissions by 50% by 2030? I think the simple answer is yes, but it's it's going to require a lot of innovation, a lot of ingenuity, and a lot of capital to get us anywhere close. But I, at the same time, I don't, I wouldn't underestimate, you know, our ability as a population to to react quickly. And and I think we've seen it in electric vehicles as an example, where 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 adoption rates have have vastly exceeded even the wildest expectations five years ago. Um, I think this, mo- this market can move quicker than most people believe, but, but it's going to require like a wholesale global commitment. And the question is, can India get there? And can China get there? And can the US get there? And other developing nations, of course. So um, I wouldn't say it's, it's a slam dunk, Jay. That's for, that's for, that's for sure. But um, I also feel like just in the last year, there's been, you know, a, a new recognition and and commitment to this market, um, and to, and commitment to fight climate change. I think just you know events, global events that that people are aware of, um, are all are all sort of helping to build this awareness. And I do think this, you know, we can react quickly. Yeah. I mean, it's funny, even in, in my social circles, the conversation is occurring with regularity on the back of just some really consistent, I guess that's the key word, consistent extreme weather events. I mean, the last three seasons that we've experienced, I'm in the Pacific Northwest, you know, just north of Vancouver and a little mountain town up here. We hit all time record heat in the summer, like Australia heat and then the Canadian, you know, uh, uh, in the, in the fall, we hit, you know, back to back, like eight or nine, what they called atmospheric rivers, record flooding all through the Fraser Valley. And this, uh, winter has just been record snowfall, um, which we never see, you know, we, we get cold, but like people think maybe Pacific Northwest is covered in snow. It's not like I'm, we're temperate. We're, you know, we're fairly temperate anyways, you know, that's just creating a catalyst to think, because once something's staring you in the face, you can talk all day about the impacts of climate change and more extreme weather patterns. But when they start hitting you, right. And yeah. putting your flood insurance on, on trial, then you start thinking about it differently. Right. <laughs> well, well, and you can literally pick just about any country or territory in the world and you can point to the same <laughs> events occurring everywhere. hundred percent. Right? And, and so, and, and that's what's, and, and, and North America, if you think about the North American market, and I like to say this, we've been asleep at the wheel for the last 10, 20 years. As Europe's actually, you know, when you think about the European Union cap and trade program, you know, they, they have far and exceeded what we've done here in North America. Um, but it seems like we're finally waking up um, and... And that's why we've seen such a, you know, a renewed interest in this, in this sector. We've all been aware of climate change for a long time, but I think people are finally starting to realize there's, there's an opportunity here to actually make money and actually, you know, have the trees left standing and alive and have those worth more than a, than a tree that's been cut down and, and, uh, and a forest has been deforested. I'm with, I'm with you. Now, I just want to say, I really hope you're right. You know, when I ask, do you think these 2030, 2050 goals are realistic? Yeah, you know, I ask because I don't know. Um, it's easy to set goals, harder to hit them. Um, I love your answer. And I, I really hope you're right. I hope you're right as the father of three young boys. You know, I hope you're right as an individual who's been a massive benefactor of time spent in wild places, you know, and, and uh, I, I'd love future generations to have that advantage. Um, you know, what you said, you said, yes, we could hit those goals. It's not a slam dunk. It's going to take a lot of innovation, ingenuity, and capital. I'll bet all day long on human ingenuity, no problem. Um, and I, I would suggest that that will lead us to the innovation, but not before 
the capital, right? That's the the missing link in, in, in a lot right. of things, right? We want to see this progress. So my question for you is, is why then are we going to see, if I have confidence in the ingenuity of human beings, I have confidence in our ability to innovate and solve problems, why should I have confidence that the capital will arrive in the, in the amounts that it will need to? Yeah. And, and when you think of those amounts, depending on, depending on uh, you know, a few different sources, the estimates are somewhere between 50 and $150 trillion that needs to be invested in these climate change projects over the next several decades to get us to that carbon neutral world that we're hoping to. So, I mean, those, those numbers are, are, are hard to even uh, imagine, but, but, you know, at the same time, we're by putting a price on carbon, which again, we're just starting to do the, you know, carbon pricing and carbon projects have been around for, for the last 15 years, but they traded at such a low value that, that nobody cared. We're finally putting a price on carbon where people believe you can make, there's money to be made. And that of course brings the capital markets into the equation, which is, again, is the, the, the entire reason we started carbon streaming is we believe there should, there should be a public markets vehicle to invest in climate projects around the world. So the, the public markets are starting to take a role. But of course, governments and individuals are, are going to have to start taking uh, an active role as well. And, and, you know, and, and between corporations, individuals, governments in a trend that we don't see going away, at least for the next 30 years. And I can talk about why I think it's going to go for, for far more than 30 years. Um, Capital should come as long as there's an opportunity to make money uh, and at the same time has a positive impact on, on the globe and helping fight climate change and protecting biodiversity and supporting remote communities. These are all the types of major benefits we can get from carbon projects around the world. Okay, so you may get this, you must get this question every now and then, you know, it's, it's <clears throat> what would make, what's the cost, I guess, for a company like, um, like a Coca-Cola? right? Who I would imagine uh, contributes a significant amount of emissions. Um, what's their incentive to become if, if this is, it's a volunt because it's a voluntary market, correct? And, and maybe explain right. that to my audience a little bit so they understand what I'm talking yeah. about. But, you know, I guess where I'm at is like, what's the incentive for a Coca-Cola to invest in becoming carbon neutral? So, so um, when we think about incentives, I mean, the, the major one is investors, Investors are forcing them, wanting them to to have a have a plan to help fight climate change and reduce emissions. And we've seen shareholder activity activists taking taking a role in challenging boards and management teams to see what they are doing for their businesses to help reduce emissions and, and fight climate change. That's the first thing. The second thing is is there's an expectation that the Securities and Exchange Commission this year will announce a policy that's going to require every public company in the U.S. to disclose their climate-related risks. And that means that, that the expectation, again, is that they'll have to start disclosing their scope one, scope two, and even potentially their scope three emissions. So that's, that's you know, when we th think about scope one, that's the direct emissions that a company produces. When we think about scope two, that's the, that's the emissions that are, that are created within the value chain that's supplying the company with its products. And scope three then is how is the, the end products that the company is producing, how are those utilized and what emissions are associated with the utilization of those pro products. So in that so regard, one, in like the Coke example, that would be the recycling of a can. So the product's been produced, distributed, consumed, and now there's an end use product that has to be dealt with as well. Is that right? That, that's exactly right. So sort of the life cycle, scope three deals with the life cycle of, of the product that's produced. And so if you, if you end up in a scenario where the SEC requires you to disclose those emissions on your financial statements, the natural next question will be, well, what are you doing to, to lower those emissions? So it's, it's becoming, you know, investors are focused. It's becoming a regulatory issue um, uh, around the world, and at the same time, of course, companies that are that are that are showing action here are able to then r raise green bonds and sustainable sustainable financing bonds, and it actually can have a very direct impact on on a company's cost of capital. And, and so you can lower your cost of capital, <laughs> increase the share price. Investors like it, so. Again, there's a financial motivation here 
as well for, for companies and boards to, to take an active role in, in reducing emissions and fighting climate change. So that makes sense to me. And the access to capital um, through just investor sentiment, as you expressed earlier, I know some major funds are, are putting, uh, as you alluded to, some um, uh, policies in place. I think BlackRock now, BlackRock has right. some. So what exactly are they doing in, in, in terms of qualifying before they allocate cash? You want to qualify a company's carbon policy, correct? Right. Well, so so what the, the commitment they've made to date is to have carbon neutral investment portfolios okay. by that same date, 2050. Got it. So they Got will it. they will want every one of the companies inside their investment portfolios to be carbon neutral. And so thereby saying to companies, of course, if you want access to capital, if you want access to our investment dollars, you've got to be carbon neutral. And, okay. and of course, as a company, you need to start taking these, you know, the, the transition away from fossil fuels and reducing emissions is going to take time. And so the companies, you know, although 2050 seems like it's a long way away and it is, you need to start taking action very soon to, um, to, to, to put yourself on a track where you can get to carbon neutral by that time frame. Yes. Yes. Okay. So follow the money, right? Other firms will follow in BlackRock's footsteps more than likely in order to compete for capital. Companies will have to fall in line. What happens though, Justin, when the broad market isn't hitting all-time highs and um, you know it's a pretty, pretty favorable ride right now, right? A good economy, sort of. Uh, if you look at the market, you'd be led to think so. Yeah. Uh, so so do, do you think, like, what, what are your thoughts? Does, does this change? Do people's priorities shift? you know, when, when times get tough? Well, you know, it's a, it's a good question. And actually I started this business shortly before COVID hit, you know, it was only four or five months before, before COVID really hit us. Mm. And, and I, you know, in, in the middle of trying to launch a company, COVID hit, I, I frankly was, was a bit scared that it was going to derail the whole business plan. Certainly. But, but actually, we found the opposite reaction, which and and you know I'm sure everyone has their different view, different you know viewpoints on on why. But but through COVID, we found people started caring more about climate change, and it became this central issue. Of course, it was around the U.S. election at the same time. People were sitting at home; they were recognizing that the world was more globally connected, perhaps, and, and climate change was an issue. At the same time, we had all these climate events around the world occurring but 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 i would say we never like for more than a couple of weeks kind of blinked in terms of the momentum that the business had even through you know that cycle what's really nice about carbon is if you think about it as an asset class really doesn't have any correlation with other major commodities of any kind and and adds this nice diversification tool and of course of course can offset uh, an investor's energy exposure, uh, as as an example. So we have interest in the company from ESG funds, environmental funds, energy funds, mining funds, all looking to offset their 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 different exposures and and again add a new asset class into their portfolio. And and because carbon's not correlated, and in some cases potentially inversely correlated with things like energy longer term, mm -hmm. um, it adds this sort of you know again. Uh, broad interest from from a large uh, subset of of investors which is which is what I love about the carbon business. Yeah. Okay, it's interesting to hear you walk through the origins, right? Right before COVID hit and um and you didn't see sentiment shift. In fact, I agree with you. People are more conscious or focused on this than they were 24 months ago. I wonder how much of that if any has to do with do you remember like during the first stage of lockdowns maybe four weeks, six weeks in. And I started seeing images of um, like uh, just reclamation, natural reclamation of a handful yes. of, of, of uh, like, I'm trying to recall some specific examples. No, so the specific you'll see or think about that I, that I remember is the pollution in China. You looked at these images of Beijing and, yeah. and the pollution and it just, and London, I think it was the same thing and it just disappeared. Right. That's and right. It was, it was, That's uh, right really exceptional images specifically around pollution around the globe um, yes. and yes. uh yeah yeah 
Yeah. And then fish returning to places they weren't and all kinds of just cool activity. And it didn't take long, did it? It was like, wait, we, I mean, it was disastrous in other uh, compartments of our life, but it turns out pausing the world for six weeks, uh, nature comes back pretty fast. Pretty quick. Yeah. And animal life was coming into the cities. I remember that, you know, the raccoons were having a field day in, in Toronto right. and nobody was around to scare them off. It's quite interesting, fascinating things that, that occurred. That's for sure. Okay. So and of course, global emissions took a pause in 2020, but as we, as we just ended 2021, they're back on the rise again. So, <laughs> so although I think we all recognize 2020 had some, some interesting pauses and momentum and, and moments of time where we could see um, what a what a green future might look like. We've mm-hmm. gone right back to the to our old ways, and we still have a lot of work to do. Are we right back? Are we right back to you know twenty nineteen levels of emissions? Uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. we had additional growth again last year in in emissions, global emissions, it's additional so, growth. Right. Yeah. I was wondering because I know like um, like I'm traveling less. You know, and you wonder if that makes an impact if, if you're so micro on the grand scale that it doesn't matter if I'm traveling less recreationally or for business. You know what I mean? Right. And when you think about the airline industry as an example is is about a billion tons of emissions. So so call it 2% of, of global emissions. So right. listen, a reduction in airline travel is certainly would have had an impact, but, you know, at the very thin margins, of course. Okay. Right? okay. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, there's... You know, it's industry, uh, and uh, it's industry that's the biggest polluter. That's that's again hard to hard to hard to reduce, hard to abate. Okay, so of that fifty billion that we're currently emitting, well, who are the who are the major emitters? Industries we're talking about. What are the what are the major offending industries? So, so your power and power and 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 utility industry is would would be the worst offender, of course, when you think about just power. Coal-fired uh, power generation and other fossil fuel um, power generation around the world, and then transport. If you take transport as sort of a global sector, including airs and cars and shipping and the entire transport industry, that's that's responsible for about thirty percent of global emissions. So okay. it's a it's a it's a big number. But but um, power and utilities, um, global transport. Uh, and then industry. So, you know, cement is like cement uh, as an industry is a, is a tarot, is a, is a brutal polluter, but industry as a, as a whole is, is that, another 10 to 10 to that, 15%, I believe. That surprises a lot of people. I mean, you could hear power and utilities and think, yeah, of course you could hear transportation, shipping, logistics. Yes, of course. But then you throw in cement and right away, it's curious to me, right? It's off the radar. I was surprised by that. Yeah, and it's and it's again, it's a power consumption. And many in many of these industries, it's the the power consumption that that is a real problem. So if you're able to take that power consumption and and turn it into green energy, renewable energy, well, that that solves a massive part of these global emissions. Okay, and I guess take two steps in any direction, and you'll see some cement. So the scale is, yeah, pretty much there. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, so so in a in an indirect way, we're talking with what we just talked about: power, utilities, transportation. These are potentially your customers, right? You're now going to be creating carbon credits that will be in demand by these industries. These are the industries, the big emitters, that are going to have to be purchasing carbon credits because they're never going to be carbon neutral, right, on their own, right? But right. investing, purchasing carbon credits, they could they could accomplish that goal. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, if, if listen, if carbon prices went to two thousand dollars a credit, they might have the incentive to, to actually somehow find. I mean, uh, the technology doesn't exist today for many of those industries to take emissions down to zero. But maybe a two dollars, two thousand dollars a credit. Uh, you know, again, you know, human ingenuity and innovation gets us there. But One day. but the expectation is is the the only way those companies get to being carbon neutral is buying and supporting carbon projects around the world and buying carbon credits. That's exactly right. Okay. So let's talk about carbon projects then. So um, this is more, this is more up your, up your direct business alley, if I'm correct. So how are you creating carbon credits, Justin? So we invest, we, we make an upfront investment into a project developer. So let, why don't we talk about the projects first? What types of projects are we talking about? We're talking about 
Um, specifically, the, the, the largest sector of this market is what we call RED projects, which stands for RED, standing for Reduction in Emissions from Deforestation and Forest Degradation, so R-E-D-D. Um, and so what the, the, the simple way of thinking about that is forest conservation projects. And forests could be terrestrial forests, it could be peat swamps, it could be seagrass, it could be mangroves. So we're protecting the world's carbon sinks from being deforested. So that's the largest part of the market. And, and in fact, all five of our projects that we've invested in to date are those red projects, which are, which are avoiding deforestation. So right There's away on, on that one, let me just pull on a thread here if I can. That's so it's funny because you explained it to me and I'm like, so we're getting points for something that we didn't do. Sort of correct, right? Correct. But yeah. because we're eliminating future forecasted carbon emissions, or I guess uh, we're eliminating um, uh, the destruction of forests that currently absorb carbon, right? So, correct. So, correct. Okay. Because so, on the surface, you're kind of like, how how are you scoring points for just not doing something, right? It's like right, yeah. and <laughs> and so there's two two important factors there. So first off deforestation as in if you were to make deforestation an industry today um, or a country let's make deforestation a country depending on depending on the numbers it would be the the second or third largest emitter global emitter as a country um, emitting close to eight to nine billion tons of of, of co2 every year um, and so and when you think about eight to nine billion tons again eight to nine times, the airline industry, the shipping industry on their own. Deforestation is a major emitter, almost 20%, seven, 16%, 17% of global emissions on an annual basis come through deforestation. So the first thing we need to do, and frankly, the lowest hanging fruit, is to end deforestation. And the only way you end deforestation is to put a price on those trees. And yes. that's what carbon pricing is doing, Got right? It. So we got to end deforestation and, and, and also, but in order to write a carbon credit, you have to be able to prove that the forest would have been deforested in the absence of the carbon credits. Got it. Okay. That's right? So I can't yeah. go in and put a, a carbon credit on the trees in my backyard that I never would have cut down. You actually have to be able to prove to independent organizations that that forest would have been cut down. And the carbon credit is provides the economic incentive to prevent deforestation. And so that's that's a that's a key criteria. It's 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 quite a stringent requirement now to to write a carbon credit on that tree. It just can't be the whole world. And the other yeah. thing to note is the forests, global forests around the world, absorb about 16 billion tons of carbon dioxide on an annual basis. So the last thing we can afford to do is reduce, reduce their absorption number. and keep um, and keep emitting by deforestation. So that's the goal of of those projects, and we're we're going to be big supporters of those projects. And at the same time, when you're investing in a forest conservation project, you're protecting the local, you're protecting animals and flora and fauna and the biodiversity that exists in those areas. And in many cases, investing in the local communities that are around these, you know, these, um, these properties. So, okay. so back to the question on, on what we do. So we will invest, let's say $10 million into a forest conservation project around the world. We've got mangroves. Uh, we've got, um, we've got a peat swamps in Indonesia. We've got rainforests in, in, in Africa. So we're protecting, let's say we invest $10 million into a project. In exchange for our investment, we then, in most cases, will get 100% of the carbon credits that are created by that project. So putting some numbers to, to paper, if I invest $10 million, roughly speaking, I'll get about a million credits in return on an annual basis. So $10 million investment, a million carbon credits on an annual basis, and then Carbon Streaming Corp will turn around and, and sell those million carbon credits to these large corporate indiv or individual retail buyers around the world, looking, of course, for the highest marginal buyer, um, and, and then turn around and we will then share usually somewhere between 70, 80, 90% of our proceeds back to the project developer 
such that they can invest in the project and and kind of have this circular economy. The goal, of course, is to create a sustainable economy where these where these trees are located. Let's take a terrestrial forest, for example. In in where this forest is located, you're trying to create a sustainable economy that no longer will rely on deforestation after a period of 20, 30, 40 years. So that's the goal of these carbon projects. Okay. Um, but but so and then so as we return, let's say 90% of the revenue, we keep we keep 10% of the revenue, and that's how we get a return on our upfront investment. And of course, which that that then provides uh, perfect leverage to an increase in carbon prices. So, you know, if the carbon price is fifteen dollars a ton, and I'm keeping and I'm keeping ten percent, I'm keeping a dollar fifty for every carbon credit I sell. Of course, if the price goes to thirty dollars, it's now three dollars I'm keeping. Um, but it also creates this alignment with the project developer, right? We're we're aligned. We're very much aligned to secure the highest price for their credits and. Uh, and because 90 percent 70 80 90 percent of the revenue is going back to the project um, they're very much aligned to keep uh, generating carbon credits keep investing in the project into the local community and um, and it, it creates this fantastic alignment of interests okay okay so I think I understand that transaction pretty well you invest 10 million in a project developer with the intention of um, preventing deforestation you are then provided with, these are numbers that we're just throwing out, but a million credits that you can then take to the market and sell to the world's emitters so they can reduce their footprints. Um, Then you reinvest back in the project developer to keep the cycle going. Um, So in this scenario, you're investing $10 million to prevent deforestation. So you're investing with a project developer. Can you give me an example of who the project, like what business the project developer would be in? So, so they're in the forest conservation business. Okay. Um, but it's, but, but what that business means, and, and let's take our Rimba Raya project. So we've got this fantastic project called Rimba Raya in Indonesia. Rimba Raya uh, has been around for 10 years. But if I, if I talk about, so what's, what's Rimba Raya using the capital for? They've got forest fire prevention. They've got, they're investing in, in, in education, in job training, in clean power and water. They're planting new mangroves. Um, they're, they're gen- generating uh, an aquaculture, uh, agroforestry uh, business. They're supporting uh, women-led businesses with microfinance opportunities. Um, so they're sort of wholesale investing in the local community in, and in that in that project area. And it's 65,000 hectares of, of peat swamp. But by investing, by, by showing that there's money to be made by protecting the forest, the local community starts to understand how important it is to protect, you know, protect this 65,000 hectares and and you get there, you know, more community buy-in, more activities that prevent deforestation. And again, it's sort of a self-fulfilling cycle. Okay. Okay. So forgive me, this is a, a juvenile question, but so they have the option of selling that 65,000 hectares to a, a logging company. They elect not to instead sell it to a project developer or someone like yourself, understanding the economic benefit of doing so. Of, there's, of, now, of, there's now an option. You're giving them an option, I guess. You're giving them an option. So, yeah. so this, this 65,000 hectares was actually gazetted for palm oil plantations Got in it. Indonesia. And so, and their entire Eastern border is surrounded by palm oil plantations. And so the project developers here came in, protected this land, prevented, the, prevented it from being turned into a palm oil plantation, and now have a 30-year project to protect the forest, protect the peat swamp, and convince the community that after 30 years, they don't need to rely on converting this land into palm oil plantations. There's a whole sustainable community that can be developed uh, as an alternative. Yeah, how about is that? Okay, that I understand clearly. Exactly. That I understand clearly, okay. That's what's been missing because historically, what do you do, right? You, You take the deal for the palm oil plantation. Your only option. You yeah. If it. you want to live, yeah. if you want jobs, if you want income, you, you want jobs, you want you want you want to you know create a better life for your kids, you take the money from the palm oil plantation. Okay. It's a great example of uh, a vote for capitalism right there. 
That's, That's right. right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now we talked about um, we talked about I guess maybe one category of carbon credits um, avoided nature loss. There's numerous. There's like four categories of carbon credits. Do I have that right? Uh, so but broadly speaking, yes, you could you could say there's there's four. When you think about well, I would I would more broadly characterize different types of carbon projects. There's something like 70 or 80 different types of carbon projects, uh, but the big buckets tend to be, you know, what we talked about. So the forest conservation, these red projects, renewable energy projects around the world. So, so, um, and most of these are now in, in developing nations, but renewable energy projects that are, that are, that are developed instead of relying on fossil fuels. So again, you're avoiding the emission of a ton of carbon dioxide from a fossil fuel power generation by utilizing renewable power. So renewable energy projects around the world are big generators of, of credits. Um, we have uh, reforestation or afforestation projects. So, so replanting the world's deforested lands. So that's now, uh, you know, the, the goal there, of course, is to absorb, take that 15, 16 billion tons that the world's forests are absorbing. And of course, increase that number, right? Pulling more CO2 out of the atmosphere. We have technology-based companies um, that are actually, you know, using these large industrial fans and, you know, the largest of which is in Iceland. And it's it's actually absorbing um, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, attaching it to a membrane and storing it underground. So that's, you know, carbon, ca- what we call direct air carbon capture projects, really, really cool projects, very, very expensive to do today. Um, hopefully, again, we see some of that in- innovation and ingenuity around, around direct air carbon capture. And, al- and also when you think about the agricultural sector and industrial se- sector, so carbon capture technologies that are actually capturing emissions from agricultural or industrial processes and storing that those carbon emissions uh, underground those would be the five or six kind of primary areas of of carbon projects and and at carbon streaming we're looking at investing in all all areas of the market that was my next question. Okay. So walk me through your your current projects and we talked about uh Rimbaraya right? That's the Indonesian uh, project that we just discussed. What else What else are you guys personally working on? So the first investment we ever made was a, a project called Marvivo. Marvivo is this outstanding development project. So this is a project that's in the process of being created. It's in Baja, California, Mexico. So on the <clears throat> Pacific side of Baja. So you think Los Cabos on the tip, La Paz, you know, on the Sea of Cortez side, and and Mar Vivo is about two and a half, three hours northwest of of uh, La Paz on the west coast of of the Baja. It is protecting twenty two thousand hectares of mangroves that are being destroyed for shrimp farming, aquaculture. Mm. This project is is protecting twenty two thousand hectares of mangroves and mangroves. As a, as a carbon sink, as a carbs, carbon absorption tool, absorb up to 10 times the amount of carbon as a terrestrial based forest. So mangroves are this, you know, fascinating carbon sink that's largely ignored. Um, and, and because it stores about 75 to 80% of its carbon underground, people think mangroves are, you know, five, six, seven, you know, 10 feet tall off the water, but they're, they're amazing carbon sinks. And, and so the Marvivo Corporation is going in and protecting these mangroves from further deforestation. But what's amazing about mangroves is when you think about a mangrove, of course, it's surrounded by a marine ecosystem. And, right. and mangroves themselves are hotbeds for, 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 for sea life um, and sea habitats. So by protecting these 22,000 hectares of mangroves, we're also protecting 137,000 hectares of a marine ecosystem that surrounds these mangroves. And that, what that will generate for us is something called a blue carbon credit. And a blue carbon credit because of the marine aspect and those blue carbon credits traded a substantial premium to, to even the nature-based uh, credits like a Rimbaraya credit. And even a Rimbaraya credit trades at a premium because of the quality of the project. Blue carbon trades at a, at a premium to that. So it's this fascinating project. It's expected to generate about a million carbon credits on an annual basis. 
And we're funding, we, we partnered with Marvivo Corporation to fund the development of this project over the next 18 months. Okay. That's interesting to learn more about mangroves because I always knew they were incredibly sensitive. And, and um, for example, uh, I was in Tulum, Mexico a few years ago. My wife and I are being pitched on this new development and I love Tulum and the development looked amazing, but uh, the road they were proposing they were going to get approval for would have to have blasted through uh, mangrove forest. And right away I was like, I don't know much about mangroves, but I understand they're incredibly protected and um, and difficult to get permits to destroy. Um, and I thought it was just the the habitat element. I didn't know that a mangrove forest absorbs up to 10 times more carbon than a terrestrial forest. That's amazing. That's right. That's exactly right. That's That's exactly okay. Right. So then can, can you walk me through a little bit, this project, um, uh, 22,000 hectares of mangroves, Contributing to then 137,000 hectares of uh, ocean environment, contributing these these blue carbon credits, which are priced yep. at a premium, will will pay you by investing in this project. You'll receive around one million carbon credits per year. So, so the transaction with them is actually we're receiving the greater of 200,000 credits or 20% of their annual credit generation. So we, for, for all intents and purposes, we assume it's 200,000 credits that will be, we will be buying on an annual uh, basis and then you know, selling, um, selling to corporate buyers. Now, this project is under development. I would expect we may upsize the size of that transaction prior to you know, the ultimate um, the ultimate uh, start date there, but that of course remains to be seen. So I would hope that we would be selling all, you know, all 1 million credits from there, but we'll, you know, of course that. Uh, Got it. Well, can I ask what's the, what will you receive from the Rimbaraya project on an annual basis? So from Rimbaraya, we, the, the Rimbaraya produces three and a half million carbon credits on an annual basis, about half a million of which to 600,000 of which is committed to, other buyers who who were involved in the project before us. So the net the net to carbon streaming is about three million credits on an annual basis. Okay, got it. Okay, so we've got the uh, the avoidance of the the palm oil plantation in Indonesia. We have the protection of mangroves in uh, in Baja California, Mexico. Um, what else? What else are you working on? So we've got um, our third investment uh, is a project called ERA, ERA, in Brazil. And ERA is a, is a project in the Cerrado biome of, of Brazil. So not the Amazon that everybody thinks about, but sort of southeast of the Amazon is a place called the Cerrado biome. And the Cerrado biome is this grasslands, um, grasslands area of Brazil that, again, is a major carbon absorber. And, uh, and has been drastically deforested over the last several decades and at increasing rates, actually, with Brazil's new government and being converted into agricultural uses and other land uses that, again, is emitting tremendous amounts of, of, of CO2. So we entered into an agreement to help protect um, a part of the Cerrado biome with the hope that we can convince more landowners and project owners to come into what we call a group project to help protect uh, larger swaths of this of this Cerrado biome. A fantastic project developer we're working with down there. Um, very excited about the landowners. We're already partnered with um, some great landowners, and um, and uh, that's a small project. It's only a five hundred thousand dollar investment on our part, and we're expecting about half a million credits over a thirty year project life there so it's small but it's you know uh it's it's sort of a new project um from a brazilian perspective and and we're hoping that we can see substantial growth down there um and we're expecting first credits from from that project um over the next several months so that one's quite an advanced it's a development project but very advanced um and uh and then we've got two projects worth noting in the Congo. Uh, so in Africa, these are two rainforest uh, red projects. Uh, and we're working with a group called the Bonobo Conservation Initiative, BCI for short. And BCI is working on two carbon credits um, in the Congo, so the northern part of the Congo, uh, on two projects called Kokolapri and Sankuru, massive, massive projects. 
that uh, again are looking to prevent the deforestation of the of of the the Congolese um, rainforest, which after the Amazon is the second largest source of deforestation in the world, and um, we're working with our BCI project partners who are, cl- are working closely with the government to try and put a plan uh, in place to end deforestation on their in, in their territory. So we're still finalizing the numbers and working on the the baseline methodologies and feasibility studies for those projects, but very, very excited to be partnered with BCI and helping to, at the early stage, try to move those projects forward. Okay. Okay. So, so where do I want to go next? Uh, first of all, how are you for time? You good? I'm good. I'm good. good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You let me know if we're yeah. bumping up against the block. Nope. Nope. Just fine. All right, cool. So, um, so then what this does, like, and I'll keep it, I think I'm keeping a high level, you know, we're looking at about 3 million carbon credits from Rimbaraya, you know, up to a million. Uh, I got that right. Up to a million from your yep. project in the Baja, right? Uh, yep. The yep. Marvivo, Marvivo. Oh, yep. um, another half million from your project in Brazil, right? Um, to be determined what you're going to do in the Congo. But uh, yep. so this 4.5 million carbon credits, a uh, couple questions about this. Where do I want to start? So first of all, this is the product you'll be taking to market, right? Correct. Yep. Yes. And you know, the, the, the bet you're making is that what you're paying for the credits, you'll obviously sell them at a higher premium. So talk to me about that spread, right? Talk to me about that spread and how do you convert these now? Yeah. So, so, so the best thing for an investor to think about is when do I enter into these agreements? So let's, let's take Rimbaraya as an example. And that's an agreement that I was negotiating a year ago but when we invested into Rimbaraya, the carbon price was around seven dollars a credit, six fifty, six fifty to seven dollars a credit. And when I calculated, we we made a forty five million dollar investment into Rimbaraya, so quite a substantial investment, which is funded forty five, five U.S. Yep. Um, and that was funded about 60% cash, 40% shares. So they're, you know, the project developers are major shareholders of ours, uh, about nine, nine, nine and a half percent shareholders of ours. But, but that $45 million valuation, I calculate based on my expected profitability over the next 20 years from that project. Um, my expected profitability using the carbon price. At the time that I execute that agreement, so seven, you know, roughly seven, eight dollars. I actually used about eight dollars in my model to calculate the discounted cash flow to ca- come up with my forty-five million dollar uh, upfront investment. If you look at the carbon price today, it's roughly fourteen, fifty, fifteen dollars a credit, um, and of course, the expectation that pricing is going much higher. So. So I can, you know, I've almost immediately turned my $45 million investment into something that I believe is worth, worth significantly more um, and will continue to be worth more as the carbon price uh, goes up. And, um, and it's just an incredible, um, you know, incredible developer that we've partnered with there. So, so when you think about, and so similarly, we take Marvivo, the first agreement that I announced, when, when we invested in Marvivo, we were using a $10 blue carbon price okay. in our model. And, and although, although transactions are kind of few and far between in the blue carbon space, the latest data suggests that blue carbon prices are 25 to $30 a credit. So um, before a single credit has been issued from that project, the carbon price is almost tripled, right? Um, and when we'll continue to have upside related to that carbon price. So ultimately what we're trying to do is, is build leverage for our investors to, you know, to that hopefully upward movement in, in carbon prices, but provide leverage to a movement in carbon prices for our investors and give them a way to get, get exposure to carbon credits of course, and also, you know, be in investing in us where we were investing in projects around the world that are, you know, that are making a difference in, in so many, you know, facets of everyday life. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, for sure, right. It looks like a, uh, a double on your Rimba project, your Rimba Raya project, right. A triple on your, your Baja project in terms of what you paid for credit, what you're going to be able to sell them for. Um, now, are there any nuances in, in the market that I should understand? So you're, 
you know, you have, can I call it an inventory of carbon credits? Um, but they don't trade like commodities or do they, right? Like is, is now when you're selling them, I guess, blue, car- blue carbon credits versus normal carbon credits, but is it that simple or is, is a carbon credit, not a carbon credit, not a carbon credit? Are there variances that, that are important? Uh, so, so there are, so <clears throat> it's one of the challenges of this market is, is every carbon credit isn't created equally. So it's, it's, it's not as simple as selling an, o- an ounce of gold on the LME and you can do it, you know, uh, within seconds Right. with carbon credits, because every project has its own unique attributes, right? At Rimbaraya, uh, just as an example, it's Rimbaraya is the only carbon project in the world that's been verified to meet all 17 of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So the UN has these global, uh, what they call Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. There are 17 of them, which are designed to make the world a better place. And Rimbaraya is the only project in the world that meets all 17 or has been verified to meet all 17. So what does that mean? It means a, a Rimbaraya credit should trade and does trade at a premium to another forest conservation project that isn't meeting all 17, right? Might, might only be made, meeting three, five, seven different, uh, seven different of these UN SDGs. And so, and also location matters, right? What you find is buyers like to offset their carbon footprint close to home. Um, so where, 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 when we look at Rimbaraya, the buyers of those credits for the last 10 years, and this is all public information. It's been Gucci, Delta Airlines, PwC, Zurich Insurance, mm. um, Inpex Energy uh, Corporation. So there's these they're 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 global consumer um, companies or global organizations that have global footprints, um, and therefore they're looking they're going to look to offset. Uh, emissions in Africa, in South and North America, in Asia, in Asia Pacific, which is obviously where where Rimbaraya is located, um, and so uh, and and then you turn around and and you'll see Delta did a press release last year about the fact that they bought and supported the Rimbaraya project mm. um, just because of the quality of that project. PwC has a web page dedicated within their sustainability um, section, a web page dedicated to their purchase of credits from Rimbaraya. Um, so these, so, uh, but you take Rimbaraya then and compare that to a, and I'm going to pick on India, but a solar energy project in, in, in India, right? And that solar energy project, it, it may be offsetting one metric ton of carbon dioxide, um, but that's kind of all it's doing, right? Where Rimbaraya is doing so much more for the local community, protecting orangutans and, and local animal life. Um, so buyers put a higher value on a Rimbaraya credit than they do a credit from an Indian solar project. Because they so get more credit that, for that, obviously, right? They're going to... The investors, you know, they both offset one metric ton of of their... of of. Delta's emissions, as an example, right? But Delta puts greater value on Rimbaraya because they market it to their investors, to their cut, their consumers, uh, to say, look at you know, look at the the quality of the project that we're supporting, and that matters. Um, so we get we we get a bit of this differentiated market where hmm. we have kind of the lowest denominator carbon credits trading today around eight dollars a credit. And then what we have is nature-based carbon credits. So, uh, and, uh, and those are trading today at roughly $14.50, $15 a credit for the average nature-based. So there's quite a substantial difference between, between the two valuations, right? And you can kind of have everything in between. There's cook stoves, uh, cook stove projects in Africa, many, and, and those credits are trading for eight to $9 a credit today, right? You also have, low carbon fuel credits in California trading at $170 a credit. And, and wow. those direct air carbon capture projects that I was talking about, those credits um, are in some cases have traded for $1,000 a credit. So you get, you, you get quite a wide, um, you know, quite a wide disparity of, of, of values. But at the same time, what we've seen over the last couple of years is a move to bring more liquidity, more transparency, 
exchanges come in to, to play an active role in trying to create, you know, a more of an exchange traded contract with, with certain credits trading at a premium or a discount to an exchange traded contract, for example. Okay. And, um, and then in that scenario, you give both buyers and sellers a bit more confidence that they're getting good value for what they're buying and selling. And so we think that would be a very positive outcome for the, for, yeah. you know, the sector, if that transparency and liquidity comes in. That, that would be, I would, yeah, that sounds like it makes sense to me. I mean, if you're, you're wanting to encourage the, uh, the, the purchase of more carbon credits by emitters, you'd love them to have the confidence that they know what they're purchasing, right. Is valuable, right. As valuable. valuable as they yeah. think it is. And so the yeah. less, the more discretion you can eliminate from that transaction, the better, because it's interesting to, to what you said about that, the, the marketability of the credit, right. You know, over here, you know, we're, we're not just reducing deforestation. We're rebuilding orangutan habitats and, you know, probably birds are going to come back right. and there's a whole bunch of things at play here. Um, and is that because it's a voluntary market that it's not just about, it's not just about getting to net zero. It's about getting to net zero in the most marketable way possible. Because at the end of the day, why are you doing this for that access to capital and who's BlackRock going to invest in? Well, they want to look good too, right? Right. And so, so we see, I mean, Rimbaraya, we get an inbound. In fact, we've never made an outbound call to sell a Rimbaraya credit. And we get inbounds yeah. almost every single day. It's certainly three times a week. Uh, today, I think we've had two to give you a sense. So, so new inbound buyers looking to buy credits from, and, and Rimbarai is fortunate because it's such a well-known project and it's been around for 10 years. Um, but the same then, if I have a Rimbarai credit, I can say, sorry, I've, so, I've, I've sold out of my Rimbarai credits, but I've got these, this fantastic avoided grasslands conversion project in Brazil. I've got this fantastic mangrove project in Mexico. I've got these, these conservation uh, projects in Africa. Um, and, and so we can start to utilize Rimbaraya in the, to, to help build portfolios of credits for, for buyers. And um, it was just going to put us at a real advantage. And, and this market, if you go back the last 10 years, this market was very much a binary market where, where, you know, buyers and sellers were coming together and buyers were saying, well, what price are you willing to sell me your credits at? And, and the project developers and the, the buyers had lots of projects to choose from. And it was a very, very tough market for project developers to sell credits into the complete reverse has happened over the last 12 months where we see this tremendous demand for credits. Supply hasn't moved because supply takes years to bring online. These projects take two, three, four years to, to develop in many cases. Right. So, so we've seen incredible demand from around the world, a shortage of supply. And now people are coming to us and saying, you know, what are you willing to sell your credits at? And we're saying, well, what are you willing to pay? And it completely has reversed the conversation and we and and giving us a chance to get true price discovery of the the value of these carbon credits. And you know, we're pretty excited about what that means for the market over the longer term. Okay, now I want to uh I want you to help me a little bit now. Um hey, look, so I, I love this story. I, I love it. Um I love everything about it. I, I love that this is just a great sort of vote of confidence and how capitalism can solve some of the world's biggest problems once you put the right incentives in place. And that's what it takes. You know, people have that's to right. incentivize to do yeah. the right thing, you know, just. Yeah. Unfortunately, unfortunately, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. it, but, but, uh, and I had a, an interview a few days ago where, where, uh, where um, the reporter asked me, why do you say, unfortunately, I said, well, in a perfect world, we'd love not to require, you know, the financial incentive, but the reality is that's what it's going to take. And, uh, and it's starting to have a real impact. Yes. Okay. Agreed. Now on the back of that though, right? Nothing's just binary good or bad. I'm, I'm, I'm a capitalist. I think it's the best Perfect. system. There's also some nefarious activity that comes with that. And we could expect that to arrive now with the surging price of any product. There's going to be a bunch of questionable suppliers of that product, right? And so the demand for carbon credits is going to continue to climb. Let's say we believe that to be the case. That's an assumption that, that we'll make today. So therefore, the providers of these credits are, uh, are going to need to increase. And there's going to be a bunch of players in the game who are probably going to make claims 
that um, they're going to be uh, in the same business you're in, right? But the projects, maybe you're so micro, they'll be able to kind of hide behind the cloudiness of the nature. Oh, it's this little packet of land over here and it was going to be deforested. We stepped in and it's like, okay, but who validates this? Okay, you got carbon right. credits now, like who validates this? Right, right. And, that, and that's where, you know, that's where the organizations that certify and validate these these projects becomes critical. And so when we think about Rimbaraya, again, I'll use Rimbaraya as an example. At Rimbaraya, we have a third party independent auditor that goes out to the project every year that verifies that the project is doing what the project is set out to do, right? It's protecting this property from being deforested, pr pr protecting the 65,000 hectares of, of peat swamp. And so there's an independent audit that's conducted. That auditor is on site in the uh, Rimbaraya will probably be on site for six weeks. Four to six, four to six weeks, they prepare a report. That report then will go to the Vera. Vera is this Washington DC based nonprofit organization. Vera will review the, the report from the independent auditor and may ask questions, ask for separate confirmations. Once Vera is okay with it, then Vera issues the, the, the carbon credits. And from and the, those carbon credits sit on a Vera registry, and from that Vera registry can be sold to any international buyer. But Vera, Vera is your protection mechanism, right? Vera is the one that requires independent audits. Itself then does itself then does an independent review before credits get issued. So it can't just be you know, some carbon cowboy who comes out and says, I've protected 20,000 hectares of land. You know, I've hired, you know, Joe Smith from down the road to write a carbon credit. And we'll probably see some of that, frankly. But, but I will tell you that the buyers of these credits, they all have their own sustainability departments who come to us and ask us for all the detailed information about why is a Rimbaraya credit a good credit? And, and so, because they don't want an egg on their face, right? They don't want the public, you know, uh, the public egg on their face if they've supported a bad project. So mm. the, the only point I'm making is it's, we've made it in the carbon industry a bit harder for those carbon cowboys to succeed and for fraud to occur. Um, it has occurred in the past in this industry. If you go back a decade, 15 years, it has occurred in the past. What's changed is they've made it harder and harder for those those types of people to succeed. Um, and I think at the same time, that'll help protect and build confidence in the market, which is obviously critical. So for my investors who are, are looking at, you know, the next early stage carbon deal, what's the good question to ask then? Is it who verifies your credits? Well, so, so first off, yeah, what what projects have you invested in, and and who's verified the credits that that those projects are issuing, and who are the buyers, right? Who who have been the buyers of those credits? Again, at, at Rim Mariah, we can point to some very household names, uh, a credit issuance history of of almost ten years, and um, and a Vera process. That's, you know, that is, uh, that adds a lot of scrutiny to those credits. And all of that information, by the way, is public. You can go up on the Vera registry and pull all of the information on Rimbaraya's, you know, credits and issuance uh, history. So, okay. um, and the fact that that's all public, you know, again, I think should, should give investors a confidence. And when we look at our, our projects, every, all five of our projects are designed to be Vera certified projects. Um, we have several projects in our pipeline that, that are also going to be certified by Gold Standard. Gold Standard would be the second largest organization in the world. Okay. But they're Vera, they're Gold Standard, they're proven certifiers of credits, and um, which will allow us to find, you know, find the buyers for those credits. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's great. No, I appreciate that. Um, Justin, this was... This is, I have like seven pages of notes on my desk right now. I love it. Um, thank you so much for spending the time with, with me and my audience and, and walking us through this market. Uh, Cause I, you know, I love the concept. I love what you're doing. Um, I love what you're doing a carbon streaming corp. And um, I love the direction of this industry. And it's maybe the first like piece of really tangible evidence that 
we are moving in the right direction towards our climate goals, you know, that I've seen ever, I think, you know. I, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I appreciate that, Jay. Uh, I, I can tell you that that um, we've been incredibly enthusiastic to, to like just the show of support that we've had um, from investors and shareholders, institutional uh, investors, bankers. I mean, it's, it's been, it's been phenomenal, but bigger than my sort of wildest dreams when I started this company two years ago cool. um, with my, with my business partner. So we're super excited. Um, we've got a tremendous first mover advantage here, which we fully intend to maintain. I built, I got seven people that are working around the clock on our on my investment team. They've got you know seven hundred over seven hundred million dollars of deals we're chasing uh, spread around the world. I'm pretty excited about what the next six to twelve months have in store. So um, stay tuned, and and I, I really appreciate your time, Jay. I know it's been it's been over an hour, so appreciate your time, and uh, hopefully we can do this again sometime soon. Yeah, no, 100%, man. I mean, this is the goal, right? We see these markets merge. I'm a speculator. I love the early stage stuff. I'd like to have a flagship position, right? That that proxy to the to the asset, whatever it is, right? I've got that in, in the car in the copper sector, for example. I I speculate in early stage copper companies, but I have one position that my audience knows really well. That is my uh, my flagship, and they're my proxy, right? And, and that I just dollar cost average into. I don't even care about the price, right? And so. Uh, right. And, and that, and that flagship company needs a flagship asset. And I'll tell you, for us, Rimbaraya is just this flagship asset that's going to be impossible to replicate, I think, for any new entrant. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're, we're really excited, not only about that project, Marvivo, which is the same principles behind Rimbaraya. Um, and, and those principles are, you know, our largest shareholders as a group, and they have a dozen other projects that they plan on developing over the next decade. We've got a strategic alliance and a, and a right of first refusal on all those projects. It's sort of built-in growth for the company with a proven developer, and that's a focus uh, of ours as well. We're, we're pretty excited about, uh, about the, our, our portfolio today. I love it, man. Well, um, uh, congrats on your success. And we got to do this again, you know, once there's more to talk about, right? Like catch up again in Would six love months to. and find out Would what else to. is in the portfolio, what's moved, what's changed. That's great. All right, Justin. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jay. Enjoy the snow. I'm jealous. Okay, guys, three last things. First, if you enjoy my interviews and would like a bit more, you can subscribe to my Friday newsletter. It's free and the comment to subscribe is right beneath this video in that pinned comment. In this newsletter, I share my key lessons learned, takeaways, and any actions that I might be taking in the market as a consequence of what I've learned on the show. Second, when I started a YouTube channel, I never anticipated generating any advertising revenue. But coincidentally, I do now, which is awesome. And so what I've decided to do is donate this to an organization that is very close to my heart called Zero Ceiling. Their mission is to end youth homelessness. The way they do this is by providing young people experiencing homelessness with supportive housing, employment, professional support, life skills, and outdoor adventure. Because often young people in urban centers with no resources will never get the opportunity to experience wild places, nature that can be so transformational and absolutely was for me. Third, if you prefer to listen to my content, you can now find us wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search for The Jay Martin Show.